Hello and welcome to this week's video. Now, this week I wanted to do something a little bit different to my normal videos where I'm normally outside uh, doing either landscape, wildlife or recently film photography. Uh, with it being Christmas, I thought, why not share a little bit, in, a bit of insight into some of the incidents that's happened to me over the last year. And I know we all occasionally get some pleasure from looking at other people's misfortunes. So today I thought I'd share a couple of my misfortunes this year. And it really got me to the phrase of a couple of times this year when I've just stood there and said, why the hell did I do that? And yeah, it's happened twice this year. So I'm gonna share those two instances with you and hopefully that will allow you to look at perhaps the last year yourself and maybe something like this has happened to you. If so, please stick it in the comments below. Um, and then we can all mourn our stupidity together. So, incident number one. So, I wanted to improve my landscape photography and I'd noticed that a lot of people who were doing their um, vlogs we're using drone footage. So I thought it would be really good to have a drone to do some drone footage for my landscape photography videos just to make it look a little bit more professional. So I got myself a Mavic Mini and I had, I'd had this drone for a while and I want, really wanted to, to sort of go out and use it. It was always windy. I'd tried it on the back garden a couple of times, just flown it over the back field and back to me and I was sort of getting a bit restless. I wanted something more. Now at the beginning of this year we had massive flooding around here and for those who don't watch my videos um, we live sort of half a mile from the River Trent and often that will flood and when it floods it covers all the fields. So this particular time I thought wouldn't it be a good idea to get some footage of the River Trent in flood and all the fields behind the house all covered in flood water. So I headed off into the fields there's a, a, a little flood bank that you could actually walk on and that was the only thing that wasn't underwater and I thought it'd be a great idea to sort of launch the drone from there. So I um, got to this flood bank, got the drone out, launched it. The, the weather, there was a little bit of wind when I started but I thought it'd be okay, it wasn't too much. So I launched the drone, got it going up into the air. I thought I'll stay safe, I'll stay at light. 15, 20 meters, I won't go any higher than that because of this little bit of a breeze that we've got. Started to fly it around in a bit of a circle away from me into the wind and uh, suddenly I got a high wind warning. I thought, ah, oh, I'm gonna have to bring it back. So at this point, what I should have done is just turned it around, flown it straight back to me and landed it. But because I wanted to fly the drone, I thought, well, it's only a little bit of wind. I'll just do a little bit of a circuit. So I flew it away and round, and I thought then I'll come up from behind me over the fields and do a, a complete circle. Well, it was okay going away from me, and then it had to go over a hedge. Now this should have given me a little bit of a warning, so I took it over this hedge, and when it went over the hedge, it suddenly sort of dropped about three feet. Nothing to do with me, I wasn't doing anything. I thought, well, that's a bit unusual. And now, when it had gone over the hedge, it was basically over a lake because the field there was now six foot deep in water and I was stood on top of the flood bank. Hopefully you can see a picture of that area now up on the screen. So I flew it and I thought, right, now I'm going to turn it back towards me. Now, of course, now it's coming back into the headwind towards me and I started to have some more problems. Again, it suddenly dropped three feet. Nothing to do with me. It's getting quite low now, and I'm thinking oh, it's about 40 meters away from me. Now I thought, well, should I just do the return to home? Because there's a return to home button on these drones where you can just hit it and it will return to home. But what it does do, you set up how high you want it to fly home to you. So on, when it's set up originally in the factory, I think it's set at 30 meters. Now, seeing as I was at less than 20 meters, I thought, it's not really sensible for it to hit that button, it to shoot up to 30 metres where it's going to be more windy and then expect it to fly back to me. Maybe I should have done that, I don't know. 
So I thought, no, I'm going to fly it back to me. I'm getting a little bit panicky now because, you know, I don't really know how to fly this thing. So I thought, right, I'll bring it back towards me. Starts to bring it back towards me. Suddenly it drops another three feet. What's it doing? I have no idea. So I'm, I am starting to panic now. So I thought, right, I'll put it into sport mode, which then uses all the power of the engines to zoom it back to you. You know, it gives it all the grunt it's got. Put it into sport mode, flicked it towards me. But I also knew I needed to go up because it was dropping down these three feet. So I thought, I need to get it back up. So now I'm pushing it up and towards me. The wind's picked up, hasn't it? It's now suddenly quite windy. It seemed like I was fighting this thing for an hour. It can only have been a minute, two minutes, bringing it towards me. All of a sudden it would drop again, bring it towards me, fight. It's not getting towards me. It's not getting any closer. It's gradually coming towards me. Before I knew it, I was about four or five feet above the water. I'm in panic mode now, um, and it was only 10 meters away from me, but it's still six foot of water underneath it. So I pushed it again, trying to get it towards me. And then all of a sudden whew, it dropped. It's literally just above the water and I'm trying to pull it towards me. And then it just went that extra foot dropped underneath the water it went. I was absolutely distraught. It's bringing that back to me now. Uh, yeah, awful. Um, probably in my teens, I would have stripped off, down to my boxers, dived in after it and recovered it straight away. Um, in my early 50s, I thought better of it and I just, I just didn't know what to do. It was gone, basically. Freezing cold water, six foot deep, about 10 meters away from me. And of course, as soon as it's gone under water and you've looked away, you're not quite sure. There's no distinguishing features on the water. You think it's there. Is there a bit of a current on the water? I didn't know. So I had to go home and leave it. And I was absolutely distraught. Knowing what I know now, what I should have done is flown it away from me with the wind behind it because the flood bank I was on actually curved away and round. So I could have tacked it slightly to the left and away from me and landed it you know about a quarter of a mile away from me on the bank and i would have probably got away with that and it would have been fine but in panic mode mm, no wasn't happening i was just trying to get it to me as quickly as possible i was a novice as i still am drone pilot and it was a disaster so anyway over the next seven days i kept walking past this because it's where i walk the dog i kept walking past where it had gone down and the water was gradually going down and um, over the next seven days, I let it get to about three foot deep before I actually went stripped down and went in and walked around this field, actually trying to feel the drone with my feet, um, with the water nearly up to my waist. Couldn't find it, couldn't feel it. I could just feel the mud under where the ploughed field was. And then when it got down to about a foot, two feet deep, I borrowed my daughter's metal detector, hoping that there was enough metal in the drone that it had set the metal detector off. Went in for an hour there, still couldn't find it. It was only on the seventh day when I went back and it was about six inches of water left and I actually saw the drone poking out of this silty mud, completely brown. Footsteps all round it in the mud where I'd missed it, like all over the place, like some sort of confused flower beetle. Picked the drone up took it home, cleaned it, spent hours cleaning it, drying it out, hair dryers, all sorts, put it in a bag of rice. Believe it or not, after about 10, 12 days, I actually got the thing flying again. The only thing that was broken was the battery that was had it. Other than that, it flies fantastic. And it's actually, I've given it to my daughter because what I'd done in that seven days, once I'd got over the shock and saying I'm never having one of those again, that's it. I went and bought another one because I knew I needed to do it again. The story doesn't end there. In um, this video, which you can see above me, the forest one, I actually flew the drone again, the new drone, just to do some a little bit of footage. And if you watch that, you'll see there's some footage and I'll put the actual footage up here as I'm talking, you'll see this is some of the footage that I did. Now I had a couple of flies with it in the woods 
to do just some of the autumn colour, which was fine. But then I wanted to fly up a little raging torrent of a stream with a little bit of a, a cascade just to fly up towards it and then you know fly back just to show you the water flowing. I went down to do it and obviously I've got trees all over me, there's no space at all so I've got it in cinematic mode because I want it to move really slowly. All of a sudden this drone when it gets near this cascade starts to shoot up in the air. Again I'm doing nothing. Must be something to do with me and water and updrafts and things like that and turbulence. It's starting to push it into the trees. Of course, I go back into panic mode. Oh, God, it's happening again. Me and water, what the hell am I doing? Tried to bring it back to me. It's going into the trees. I'm trying to bring it down. I'm, I'm pulling the wrong, wrong joysticks because now I'm in panic mode again. Eventually, after about five minutes, and I have to say, if anybody's seen that um, scene from Harry Potter where his broom is possessed, I think it's during a Quidditch match or something. Uh, yeah, I have seen it. Um, my drone was simply like that and I've got Leia laughing on the bank, she's killing herself laughing at my ineptness and it, literally I spent, it se again it seemed like an hour, it was probably no more than a minute trying to wrestle this thing, hit a few branches and uh, you know chop those up and chop the propellers up as well and managed to get it to the edge of the stream on my side and um, I was just about to land it, but it was in a puddle of water about a centimetre deep. And I thought, well, I'll just move, if I move it to the, to the left a bit, it will be out of that puddle. So I pushed the joystick to move it to the left, actually moved it to the right and dropped it in the stream. And as you can see from that footage, I leapt off the rocks, managed to get it before it got swept away. And again, it was a drying out job. I think it still works. I've not really tried it out, but it wasn't in the water too long, so I'm hoping it's fine. So that's my... Um, brush with drones and one of those occasions where you know why the hell did I do that why don't I just keep away from water the one that hurts the most is the one I'm going to tell you about now and this is to do with film photography and now anybody who watches my channel will know I've dabbled with a bit of film photography recently because I um, really admire the work of a photographer called Simon Marsden who used to do, um, when he was still around, infrared film photography of sort of old abandoned castles and buildings and eerie places and really give them some mood and creepiness to his shots. I absolutely love them. And I started to try and sort of recreate those with a digital camera and then eventually went to using uh, film and which that's something I'm still working on at the minute and you know will continue to work on so if you're interested in that sort of thing just keep your eyes on the channel there will be more coming now I've got one film camera but I decided I wanted something a little bit more professional because the one I'd got was a bit not basic because they're all quite basic but it wasn't as rugged as I wanted and I settled on a Pentax MX and I managed to get this camera off eBay and it's one of those occasions on eBay where you get something and when it arrives it's actually better than you thought it was going to be. This thing was pristine, it was absolutely lovely and it had come from a guy who is basically his dad's and his dad had passed away and he was selling off his, his camera gear basically, his old film stuff. So I knew this camera had got history, it had got real history, you know, what stories could this camera tell, what images had it taken when he'd looked through that camera. It just sort of gives you like a a link directly to a person and what they were seeing. So yeah, I really felt the history with this thing. The only thing I had to do was replace the light seals, which I, I did, it's the first time I'd done that. And I really, really loved this camera and wanted to use it. So I thought what I'll do, I'll take it out to Lincoln at night time and I'll do some night photography in Lincoln. So doing some of the architecture and I know there's some little winding back roads in Lincoln with, um, old sort of style lighting um, and cobbled streets and things like that so I thought yeah it'd be great and I recorded this little bit because I was obviously I was going to vlog it as well at the start um, so I'll let you listen to that now hello and welcome to this week's video now this week um, I'm taking a little bit of a chance I've bought an untested film camera um, with somebody who doesn't really know how they're using it and black and white film that I've never used before to Lincoln at night to do some nighttime film photography. Yeah, um, what what can possibly go wrong? Right, obviously, one shouldn't tempt fate, 
Um, so that was the situation. I've taken my carbon fibre travel tripod with me because I knew I was going to have to do long exposures, so more than a second with it being dark. I'd got infrared film in the camera, I wanted to see how that reacted because I'd not used it before in the dark. And I walked up and I was, wasn't even going to go to this place, but as I walked up through Lincoln I saw there's an old um, Tudor building on a bridge that the canal runs through the centre of Lincoln. And as I was looking at it I could see these railings and the canal and the canal wall leading to this bridge and then the Tudor building on the top with all the lighting because obviously it was dark. And I thought that looked quite a nice photo. The only problem was I had to place the tripod to get the railings curving into the image and get them in. I had to place two of the legs of the tripod the other side of the railings towards the canal. Some of you are guessing what's going to happen here and, and this still upsets me. <laughs> so, set the camera up, landscape mode. I needed it in portrait mode. Now for those of you again who have been watching my channel, you know with my Sony cameras I've used um, L brackets quite a lot. And the thing with L brackets is, is when you set your, like, if you decide you want to take a landscape shot and then you decide you want to take it portrait, all you do is undo your camera, turn your camera over, re fasten it in and you then shoot in portrait. Um, that's all very well, um, but obviously with a film camera I hadn't got an L bracket. So even though I'd lined the camera up, I knew I needed to do it in portrait. So what I had to do is tip the camera to one side. First mistake, I tipped the camera towards the canal side. So I'm on a very lightweight carbon fiber travel tripod with quite a heavy, even though it's quite compact, um, film camera and have now tipped it towards the canal but I thought I was on top of this because I, I, I probably in my mind realized this and I'd line I'd set the tripod up so it was quite stable still I thought so I set it up and then I thought ah I need a cable release because I'm doing a long exposure now unlike digital cameras I hadn't got an infrared one where I can just press a button and it'll fire the camera even though there's nothing attached you have to physically have a cable so I got that out of my bag screwed it into the um, shutter button it must weigh around a gram if that and left it there dangling now because I was doing a vlog I needed to find out what I needed to say to you guys believe it or not you know sometimes I do write a bit of a script for this trust me <coughs> I do so, I went down into my bag to get my little book, what I'd written, what I was going to say, or what I needed to say. As I did this, I noticed the leg through the bars of the railing gradually lift in slow motion. It was, it was a wonderful movement, almost poetic and sort of like some sort of ballet as, as the leg lifted. And I saw the camera tip in slow motion. And then I saw the legs upend and I saw the camera completely upside down. And then it hit the water with the grace of a Tom Daly gold medal dive. Um, and in slow motion I reached over and was never going to get anywhere near it as the final of the three tripod legs disappeared into the canal. This canal, I don't know how deep it is. If I was 19, 20 I would have probably followed it in. I considered it at the time. Um, but A, I'd got my bag would have been left ab above. There were people around, surprisingly, in Lincoln at this time. There were one or two people around, and the way my look I seemed to be going, um, I could have gone in after it, got out, and found that my bag had gone. Worse than that, I could have gone in after it, not got it, drowned, got tangled up in something, drowned. So common sense eventually got the better of me and I didn't go in after it, but I was, and still am, incredibly upset about that instance because I knew somebody had cherished that camera for 40 years. I knew that it had got a history. It had been passed on to me, all right through eBay, it had been passed on to me to cherish and perhaps have it for another 40 years. And what had I done? I'd had it five minutes and thrown it in a canal. I, yes, it was extremely upsetting. Um, eventually I went home after I'd sort of 
wandered around a bit, what can I do, what can I do, is there any way I can hook it out, I can't even see it, how deep is it, how far down has it gone, all these things were running through my mind, I eventually I had to go home, I phoned Mel and said, this is what's happened, and, and <sighs> that was it. By the time I'd got home, the only way I could resolve it in my mind was, I mean, those of you again who watch my channel, I know my daughter's an archaeologist and a historian, and obviously that plays a big part in our life, the stuff that we, we listen to and watch. And the only thing I could think of was like the, the old fens where the walkways where people would make offerings to the, the gods of the underworld. And I thought, well, perhaps it's my photography god I've just offered a, an offering to and perhaps this will improve my look. That's the only way I could look at it. And that's the only way I still continue to look at it. And, and on the funny side, I also think in a thousand years time, some archaeologists still dig that up and think, how, how did this happen? How has a 1980 camera attached to a tripod from the 2020s? How, how, how has that happened? This strange amalgamation of things that shouldn't really belong together. Um, so yeah, that still does upset me. And what I had to do again is go and buy another Pentax MX. This one didn't cost me 64 quid like the original one did. This one cost me 120. Um, I had to get a new carbon fiber tripod. Again, I was upset about the tripod, but the tripod just didn't have the history. I knew I could just replace it and get another one. I know this sounds quite blase, but you know I'm not made of money, and I knew it was going to cost me, and it was my own stupidity that was going to cost me. Um, in the end, you know that's. That's what it was. It was going to cost me money I didn't really have, but we live and learn, so they say. So hopefully this won't happen again next year. So anyway, they are my two disasters that's happened this year. I hope you've enjoyed listening to them. Um, now, what I'd really love people to do is if they've had any experience that rank alongside mine or if they can better any of mine, you know, if you've had that um, £6,000 lens that you've dropped off, up, dropped off a mountainside um, and had to buy another one and not tell anybody, then, you know, I'd be interested to hear it. Don't worry, I won't tell anybody else, um, but just stick them in the comments to this video. Um, it'll help in two ways. One, if people do comment and they have got things that's happened to them, it'll make me feel better in the fact that I know I'm not the only one that it happens to. Um, and also I think it's quite cathartic to to get this out of your system I already feel better knowing that other people know that these things have happened to me so um, yeah a problem what shared is a problem halved is that anyway I hope you've enjoyed this if you have please give the video a thumbs up it's just a little bit of light-hearted fun um, I can laugh about it now trust me um, I'm laughing on the inside um, hopefully you've, you've enjoyed it. Have a great Christmas and hopefully New Year will be better for us all and we can all get out and do some photography all around the world wherever we are and we can move and do that wherever. Um, but until next week, um, I'll see you then for another video. Hopefully, I'm not sure what I'm doing next week. I'm still chasing short-eared owls. I'm still testing out my Tamron 15600 G2, this time with a Metabones adapter. So far, all is good. And I've also got a giveaway to do next week, which, um, yeah, if you want to get notified, obviously subscribe to the channel and then you'll see what you need to do to enter that competition for a nice bit of brand spanking new photography kit that I'm sure you'd find useful. Anyway, have a great Christmas. See you next week.